Welcome to We Question and Learn. This is Tom Pies. We're proud to say we're celebrating our 18th year here on the air at WQLN. Coming into July, it'll be our 19th year and uh, certainly a cause to celebrate. Through the years, we've had some outstanding guests, as we do today. Uh, we're honored to have Robin Dowling, the Executive Director of Stairways Behavioral Health. Guy Signor, are you in the same room with Robin today? I am. And, and Guy, you're the president and CEO at Journey Health System, and uh, that's in Bradford. We're going to learn quite a bit today. So, Robin, can we start with you? And if you would, for a, a minute here or so, give us um, an education as to what Stairways is and what it does. So, Stairways has been around for about 61 years now, providing mental health and addiction services to the area community. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We receive funding from Erie County, um, fee-for-service. We bill a managed care company, and through grants and donations um, is how we, we receive our, our income. We primarily serve Erie County. Occasionally in some of our programs, we will serve people from out of the county, but that generally gets approved. Um, so all of our services are provided within the county. And basically, brief outline of what you specifically do for Erie County. Okay, so we have a number of mental health services. We have an assertive community treatment team, which hmm. is sort of uh, like a hospital without walls. There is a psychiatrist, nursing staff, um, uh, people to help individuals get jobs and case management and health care. Um, we have a blended case management program, which uh, helps individuals get hooked up with services within the county. Mm -hmm. We have a mobile medication management program, which visits people in their home and helps them uh, uh, learn about their medications and also uh, works with them to take their medications on a regular basis. We have an outpatient drug and alcohol program located on, uh, at 2911 State Street. And across from there is an outpatient mental health program uh, located at 2910 State Street. We have a psychiatric rehabilitation program which helps individuals um, build skills and uh, learn uh, how to interview and, and um, get prepared to work if they need to, helps them with their ADLs and connects them in the community as well. We have a long-term structured uh, residential program. The length of stay is about six to nine months. Mm. Those individuals receive specialized uh, mental health services, um, sort of intensive, but, but gets them prepared again to work within uh, and live within the community. Uh, we have a residential treatment facility for adults. This is a really a non-hospital inpatient program. This is a treatment center, which is uh, length of stay is around 28 to 31 days. Uh, I think our average length of stay is, is the full time um, of that service. And again, psychiatrists, therapy, groups, um, medication management, et cetera. We have Gage House dual diagnosis treatment program. This is for individuals with mental health issues as well as drug uh, abuse uh, issues. Um, we also have an uh, employee assistance program. We serve, oh goodness, over about 125 to 30 organizations providing them EAP services. Um, we have what's called a Fairweather Lodge program. This is sort of a congregant living program with a specific focus on, again, skills building and uh, training and, and people, you know, helping people get jobs in the community while learning to live in a setting and take care of a home and um, work as a group and have support uh, in that home. Um, there are NARS staff in the home. The, the services are provided to them. Uh, uh, as needed and wrapped around them. We have um, about uh, 43 personal care home bed beds. They're um, enhanced, it's called enhanced personal care. 
and it's called enhanced because those individuals have to have a mental health issue, a serious mental health illness to live in the, in the um, personal care home. And those are really truly their homes as long as they, they uh, are able to be there. And, and then lastly, we have a uh, apartment program called Irma Seligman Apartments, mm -hmm. and that's in collaboration with HANDS. Um, mm -hmm. That's a HUD-funded service. There are 20 individuals that live there on a full-time basis. It's sad to hear the community has these burdens, but it's also very fortunate for us to have stairways in our community, and your list is incredibly long. I knew about many of them, but not all that you had listed. It's certainly a daunting task. It must feel that way at times. So we're, we're glad Sometimes you're in the community. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tom. Along with Robin Dowling here today, we have a Guy Signor. And Guy, you're up from the south, Bradford, Pennsylvania. That's where your main office is, mostly? Correct, yep. Great. That's where our corporate headquarters are. Super. And you're the president and CEO of Journey Health Systems. And if you could, for a minute, give us an outline on, on your outreach and efforts. Well, Journey Health System is basically a network of behavioral health care providers. We have seven affiliates that make up the Journey Health System. And we basically, what we do is take the administrative burden of managing finance, marketing, uh, communications, the, the things that are normally back office kinds of things. We take that away from the uh, affiliates and we focus on that so they can focus on their mission of basically taking care of all of those things that Robin just listed. That, that's an excellent program. I spent about, trying to go back, 13, 14 years with the nonprofit partnership. And one of the things that was always an effort was to encourage consolidation, a central source for services, someone to help coordinate the back room so that the talented people at organizations can go out in the community and do what they do best. It's, it's a great idea. How long have you been managing that organization? Uh, since 2015. Okay. This, is it a new concept or was it something you jumped into? Uh, it's, it's a new concept. We, we began thinking about it probably in about 2013 and we affiliated with Stairways in 2014. You and Robin are here today. I'm sure you'd like to address the issue of why you'd like to speak with us. We're certainly glad you called in today. Give us an outline of what you, you feel are the critical issues, the behavioral health issues for providers as yourself in the 21st century. Well, I'm going to let Robin talk about that because I think she's going to probably expand upon the impact that we've had as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we are seeing in behavioral health, and as many companies are, a staffing shortage. Mm -hmm. But I think that the behavioral health field is, is actually feeling it a little bit stronger. Glad to hear that. Robin, so what, what do you feel the key issues are? Well, I think a lot of the key issues uh, stem from the fact that COVID isn't over yet, and um, we're still having to modify our service delivery. Uh, and with the patients that we serve, you know, a lot of them are fearful. A lot of them didn't want to come out of their homes, and mm -hmm. we're, um we had to change the way we provide services. We use telehealth and phone calls as opposed to face-to-face -face, uh, uh, connections. Um, and, and as Guy said, a, a big issue that has, has come upon us in the past two years is recruitment and retention. Um, we just can't find staff. Uh, we've done job fairs and we've We've done uh, open interview days, and uh, we get very little uh, results from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, most recently, so I am pleased to say, just in the past couple of weeks, we have been able to hire about six people. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the first and largest amount of, of staff we've been able to hire in about a year and a half at one time. Congratulations on that. So obviously COVID is still an issue. Staffing is short. What about qualified people? Is this community able to offer enough educated or trained people that you can utilize in your services? Well, we have had trouble finding uh, therapists and nurses as well. Oh. Uh, oh, wow. We have, yeah, we've mm -hmm. had to uh, offer some 
some pretty large bonuses, sign-on bonuses, and um, to stay competitive. And we've looked at, you know, uh, we've advertised how good of a benefit package we have here at Stairways, and it's just it's just been a challenge to to get people. And yes, I believe there is a shortage of of nursing staff and other qualified staff. Um, I know that enrollment has been down in some of those um, psychiatric type courses at, at the local colleges as well. So this is going to be with you for a little bit, not just a few months, but maybe even a year or more. Yeah, we yeah. we anticipate that, and yeah. uh, it's been nice to receive all of the COVID funds, the the um, um, supplemental. Uh, um, or, excuse me, the supplemental monies that were provided to organizations to help them fill in the gaps when they weren't able to provide or meet their, their service provision quotas. Um, that was really nice uh, for us all to, to, to receive from Erie County. And uh, in a meeting uh, last week, uh, the county pointed out that, you know, they have helped providers um, to the tune of about $24 million thus far, they are wanting to keep the monies in, in our county. So I got to give a shout out to Erie County for caring about the providers and caring about those individuals that we serve to keep that money here and share it to keep us all in business. And with that, you're still short employees, skilled employees. Yes, yes we, and it's, 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 a problem across the board where we're all having the same issue. Yeah, it's almost like you got to bank some of that money, and I'm sure you have, to be prepared to pay someone qualified when they do knock on your front door looking for work. Yeah, one of the things the county did most recently is raised our rates, the county and the MCO. So that helps us to be able to, um, to bring in more money when we do provide a service and also will help us to, to maybe raise some of the salaries. We've been able to use the monies that they provide us thus far for recruitment and retention. But if you're, if you're not providing the service, it's hard to give increases during that time because you can't sustain that if you're not providing the service. So the ability to, to have these rate increases will help us with that. We're talking with Guy Signar, and that voice was Robin Dowling. Could you explain how you two, your two organizations, have become partners? Well, it, it began with sort of a vetting process. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, you know, attorneys were involved and yeah. agreements were, were signed. And uh, we went to court and decided that um, uh, finally that our board decided that this would be a good thing for us to do as an organization. And so... As Guy said, in September of 2014, uh, we began the uh, to, to as a I think the first affiliate outside affiliate of uh, Journey Health System at that time. And so, how has it helped us in a, in a number of ways? <clears throat> as uh, Guy said, the support services, which include fiscal, HR, fund development, uh, marketing, and communication, uh, what am I missing, risk and compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I got them all. Uh, yeah, so those, that, those property management. Oh, <laughs> so essentially, Journey Behavioral Health is helping you. They help you service the community. They do, and they help us uh, uh, save monies by economies of scale for things like professional liability insurance, healthcare, um, uh, bulk buying, um, that kind of thing. And, and we hope in the future, um, this ha hasn't happened yet so much, but to be able as a group to kind of leverage um, the value-based payment system in the managed care world uh, in the future. So um, we also are able to collaborate amongst the affiliates by, for instance, we all have problems with outpatient, no one makes money in mental health outpatient. So we have an outpatient work group. And so the ideas come from all the affiliates as 
are, what are some things we can do to, to improve as a group and how can we all work together and what do you do well that might, um, we might also copy that and use in our organization, et cetera. So if you take an overall picture of this, you two are working together to um, improve the services you provide. Is this novel in the nonprofit world or the behavioral health world? Or is this something that's been happening for a good period of time, say five, 10 years, or is this relatively new? I think it was relatively new in 2014 when we first went down this road. I think right. nowadays right. it's much more prevalent. I think hospital systems were doing it before us. Uh, so we just kind of rode those coattails and, and, and in behavioral health, we realized that we could do the same thing by saving money and helping providers do what they do. So as you two are working together, what are your plans moving into the future? Well, we, we both, um, both organizations are going through a strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. Their ways is engaged with a company that's local out of Erie, and Journey Health is actually engaged with Open Minds, which is the uh, national leader in behavioral health organizations for strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to have these consultants work together as much as they can with Robin and I acting as a liaison mm -hmm. between the two plans and trying to figure out how that's going to fit and how we're going to move forward in the future. I know Robin has a lot more details with what's going on in Erie with, with Stairway, so I'll let her kind of update that. Good. Well, just to say the, the collaboration between uh, Open Minds and Journey and Stairways and Strategy Solutions, um, the Deb Thompson organization, um, is very congruent. Even though they were done separately, it's amazing that um, a lot of the things are very similar that we, we need to focus on. Of course, Open Minds at a higher level because it's a larger, we're talking about systems, but locally here in Erie, it was really nice to, we've had some home homegrown uh, strategic plans over the past few years. Mm -hmm. And it was, we hadn't done a formal one here for a very long time at Stairways, so it was time. Uh, post a couple of bad years uh, prior to the pandemic, for various reasons, there were shortage, shortages with doctors and um, there were uh, um, other issues in, in our field that, you know, kind of caused us to... Um, to be in the red for a couple of years. So we did a very um, intensive work plan uh, to turn that around. And I'm am pleased to say we did turn that around despite the fact that there was a pandemic. Right. Uh, so we, we thought it was a really good time to kind of go back out into the community and find out what our stakeholders um, think about us and might recommend to us to improve uh, here at Stairways. And so it's been a really great process. Our board is very invested in it, and <clears throat> we are probably going to come out of this with maybe a couple of new unique services mm -hmm. and just an improvement overall and actually probably better co coordination with Journey Health System as well. But I Googled Open Minds, and that's a national consulting firm. And their concept is to help you improve your health care, your care that you provide to the community. It's a model uh, and an education for you then? Yes. Yep. And one of the things I'll say for, about the strategic planning process, and that's why we're sitting here today talking to you, mm -hmm. because one of the things the stakeholders in Erie really pointed out was they didn't understand the relationship between Journey and Stairways. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to kind of just let people know what Journey does in regard to Stairways and, and how the systems are benefiting each other. Well, and the partnership you've created can only enhance your service to the community. Correct. Robin, as you look at your organization, I was going to ask you where do you see all this in a few years, but you've already answered that to some degree. And I think the first thing is you're in the process of continuous improvement. You're trying to add value to the organization. And it sounded like you are interested in adding more services as well, even though your list is incredibly long. It's impressive. Am I on the right track with you there? Yeah, I think we're all in working with the county and the managed care company and knowing what our stakeholders and our consumers need. Um, we'd like to be able to fill some of those gaps as well. Like I said, uh, you know, a big gap is 
and maybe I haven't said it yet, but the homeless population um, really needs, it has it, been a focus of the county and others the past, well, for quite some time, but um, most uh, importantly, through the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. there have been some issues there. So we're all working to improve access for those individuals to get care. And also there's uh, a lot of gaps with uh, youth that are leaving, um, you know, foster care, aging out of foster care, aging out of mm. group homes that they may have lived in for till they're 18 mm. and have nowhere to go. So one of the things we've been talking about is using our Fairweather Lodge program to to sort of have a place for some of those individuals to go that are qualified and we can help them in a, in a way to be able to provide services to them and help them learn skill, skills to, to live independently. So with that said, maybe just as an approximation, how many individuals are at need, would you say, for your services? Oh, goodness. You know, there are many. It's amazing that there are so many of us providers in Erie County, but there's still no 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 uh, uh, short list of, of consumers, you know, it's, it's just yeah. grows every day. Yeah, that's where I was headed towards. I mean, is there a round number? Let's say there's 270,000 plus individuals in our county. How many or what percentage uh, are in need? Or does that number fluctuate too dramatically to demonstrate? I think it fluctuates and I'd, I'd be remiss in quoting a number because I don't know it exactly. So I can tell you that we serve around 7,000 uh, individuals ourselves. Um, that kind of fluctuates as well. Oh, that's the um, number I was looking for. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's not a yes. small number. That, that's a substantial number of individuals here. It, it is. It is. And like I said, it grows uh, every day as well. And one of the things that we we are seeing is individuals who – Previously, uh, would have maybe sought more private care mm -hmm. uh, with private psychiatrists um, hmm. seem to be uh, coming and wanting services from us. So that's been a change that we've noticed. And we do do take other insurances um, on usually a limited basis. We're more of what's considered a public mental health clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because we're licensed and we have certain regulations we need to follow. But we have found in the past, um, since the pandemic, others are wanting to come to our facility. And that creates issues. Do you have to screen people, make sure folks are cared for? Not that you provide medical care, but you have to make sure that folks are healthy enough to partake of your services. Yeah, they have to meet certain criteria to receive the service. Um, we primarily serve the SMI or seriously mentally ill at our most of our programs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, and again, the list of services I gave you of those that list of services, about six of those services are really unique to stairways, um, and can't and at this point in time would not be uh, per, you know duplicated um, because of the cost of the service and because of the uh, amount of, of individuals that we would be able to treat. Plus so. the expertise that your organization has to offer those half dozen services here. Yes. As you look at all this, what does it cost? What's your budget like? Round numbers. We have about a $21 million budget, annual budget. Yeah. Total, that would be total. And I, I always ask that question because it's indicative of the service you provide. Um, yeah. Some some mm -hmm. things are expensive. Medical people, doctors, etc., professionals yep. are expensive. Absolutely. But then you get down through the staff, the outreach, the transportation you mentioned prior, and just having yep. a building or two, it may be a bargain for our community. It's just sad that we need twenty one million to balance our community. I'm I'm sorry to hear that. But I'm sure you provide good service and I'm sure that the community would be at a loss without you. Guy or Robin, do you have any concluding remarks that you might consider important relative to the audience as what they should know about your outreach and what you do or what you're planning to do? Well, I, I can say that Stairways is committed to being around another 60-plus years, uh, we hope, 
And um, we are also committed to our mission, uh, which is to provide services to those with mental illness and substance abuse at any stage of their recovery in their life um, and help them move forward uh, just so they can have a good quality of life. And the service goes both ways. It's to these individuals who need your help, but the community is dramatically serviced by your being able to have these people become part of the rest of us, so to speak. I, I hope yes. I said that mission correctly. Yes, you uh, did. Robin Dowling, Chief Executive Officer of uh, a wonderful organization, Stairways Behavioral Health. And Guy Signor, thank you for your visit with me today. How can people find out more about you? We have a website, obviously, www.stairways.com. Behavioralhealth.org. They can call uh, 814-453-5806 and either be answered Monday through Friday by our, by our receptionist, or there, if not, there are prompts as to where they can go. We also are on Facebook, and uh, there are multiple ways that they can contact us. Guy and Robin, thank you very much for visiting with me today. I learned quite a bit, and I hope the audience did as well. If they have any unanswered questions, they should feel free to get in touch with you. Once again, thank you for visiting today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Welcome to We Question and Learn. This is Tom Pies. We're celebrating now the beginning of our 19th year here on the air at WQLN FM 91.3 WQLN MPR. Two very special guests today. And I'm going to introduce someone that's been on the air here and has done some fine interviews uh, with different guests with us, Debbie Thompson. Uh, Deborah Thompson is the president of Strategy Solutions. She's a well-known consultant, a trainer, and peer reviewer. She belongs to the Standards for Excellent Institute, and I'm sure that refers back to your company, Strategy Solutions, as well. Right, Deborah? It does. The Standards for Excellence Institute is the organization that brings forth the standards for excellence, which is an ethics and accountability code for the nonprofit sector and outlines best practices for how nonprofits can achieve excellence in their performance. And we're also very fortunate uh, today to have the director of community development from the American Cancer Society. And I think you're on the eastern part of Pennsylvania. Eric McGaggy, is that you on the line today? It is. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to have you both today. This is a very near and dear topic to many people's hearts, as, as you both know. Deborah, you suggested this interview. Could you just give us your insight? What, what were your thoughts in having this kind of program today? Well, well, first of all, the word cancer is a word that touches many, many people's lives. And one of the things that Strategy Solutions does in our professional work is community health needs assessments for hospitals, health systems, health departments all over the country. And what we found in our work is if you add up all of the incidences of different types of cancer, and we all know somebody that has cancer in our families, our extended families, or our friends network, it touches all of us. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about it enough. And the American Cancer Society is doing amazing work in not only cancer research, but in care delivery support and support services for people who have cancer and are trying to live with cancer and and have good survivorship, even in spite of cancer. And it's important to talk about the things that are going on. Absolutely. And I have, yes, and I happen to be the chair of the Northwest Pennsylvania Advisory Board for the American Cancer Society. So we want to get the word out for people to really understand what's actually happening in our local community. I wanted people to understand your qualifications and how you were able to help this wonderful organization, especially in our community. And on the line as well is Eric McGacky. And you're uh, on the other end of the state. Could you tell us a little bit about where you are and what your uh, title and position involves? Sure. I actually live in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, and a good part of my responsibility is to work with communities uh, across most of the, the width of Pennsylvania and the southern tier even of New York State, um, just working with different events, connecting with different communities, and, and helping people get engaged in, you know, in the fight against cancer and, and mobilizing people to make the difference that, that is key to all we do. And at the American Cancer Society, we have a long, rich history. But what we really have and what we've always really 
been is a, is a volunteer-led organization. We are led by volunteers. We realize the communities we work in are where we have the biggest impact. We, we're known for research, and we've done billions of dollars in research, and, and everyone's well aware of those pieces. But the biggest piece that we feel makes the biggest difference is touching all of our communities and having a chance to help everyone realize that there are resources available to them in your community, no matter where you are. And Northwest Pennsylvania has a great, great history of, of accomplishments. And where, where we sit in Northwest Pennsylvania is to make a huge difference. And I'm super thrilled that Debbie was able to join us today. She is the chair of our, our board of advisors for Northwest Pennsylvania and really has a great ability to take this board and help us make a difference in the community so everyone can see that there is help available to them. It's not something that is somewhere else or only in a major metro, but in every part of our community that there are access to, access to services, that there's resources available to, to everyone. And our hope as we move forward is that people realize when you hear those words or someone you care about hears those words, you have cancer. But it's not like, well, let me start looking what the opportunities are, but to have an awareness to reach out to the American Cancer Society, to know our members of our community, the leaders in our community like Debbie and so many of our other board members to make a difference in the lives of our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers. Eric, how long have you been uh, involved with your organization? I've been with the American Cancer Society a little over 14 years, mm -hmm. and uh, it is a, definitely a, a personal piece for me. I lost all four of my grandparents to cancer. Mm -hmm. This month, actually, for me, marks 30 years of cancer survivorship, and um, I've been a caregiver to family members who are no longer here and friends who are no longer here, and, as well as many of those who have survived and, and are thriving today and have lived through their cancer diagnosis. And um, it's a very personal personal part of people's lives, and, but the power of, of what like Debbie just talked about, talking about it more, making people aware of it before they need it, is just, it's just huge. I know we were distracted by COVID. That doesn't mean COVID is less important. And certainly cancer is a premier yeah. concern in all our lives. Tell us a little bit about the structure of your organization. How many organizations or people belong to it? Do you meet often? How, how does your organization manage itself in the community? Yeah, I, I think in, in this area, we're looking at having, at this point, we have thousands of folks engaged in what we do. Um, so through our partnerships with our health systems, through our outreach, through our volunteers who work with all of the different events that we have across Northwest Pennsylvania, um, we have thousands of volunteers who are engaged, as well as our mission delivery programs like a Road to Recovery. Um, but in particular, I think for this board, this board of advisors for Northwest Pennsylvania, which which Deb is the is the chair for, it's a small group at this point. We've been building it up through this last year. Um, I believe at this point we're looking at nine current members. We'll probably be looking to add a few more in the next several months to to round out our group. But really looking for a neat group of people and leaders who really help us serve that Erie, Crawford, Warren, Venango, Forest, and Mercer County areas in Northwest Pennsylvania and serve that area and help deliver the message and the mission and the purpose and the availability of what the American Cancer Society can do for others. So if somebody wanted to get involved with your program, how would they get in touch with you? How do you establish members of a board or volunteers that work with you? Anyone who's ever interested in any aspect of being involved with the American Cancer Society can call our national number, which is 1-800-227-2345. And to say I'm interested in serving, I heard about information on this wonderful program, and I'd like to learn more about the Board of Advisors in, in Northwest Pennsylvania. That information will get sent to me, and, to, and what I would do is reach out to Debbie, and through, she and I would have a conversation and say, all right, let's reach out to these folks and see what their needs are, what their wants are, and, and really make a difference. And whether that be for joining this board or for joining a Relay for Life event or helping us with our daffodil campaign, which happens in early in the, in the year, those are all great opportunities, and that phone number is a, is a simple resource to get to us. Um, but any other piece I would share is our website is cancer.org, which is just a constant resource used by over millions of people every year to find out what they need to know. And the number one, the number one thing people reach out to the American Cancer for, American Cancer Society for, is our information and what we provide. Mm -hmm. All of us who are not sitting at the round table, and I wish we were, all of us here, and, and I'm sure many, many listeners are, have been touched by this uh, terrible, terrible disease. Let's talk about people who survive. Let's talk about maybe people who need additional care. How do you establish that? How do you work with the community? So the number one reason people call the American Cancer Society, as they just shared, is information. They're looking to understand information um, 
about a family member or themselves if they just received a diagnosis. The number two thing that people look for when they call the American Cancer Society is transportation to treatments. And if you think about most households, if you live in a two-income household, if one of the members of your family who's an income earner has a cancer diagnosis, the other they are probably not going to be able to work during a part of that or for all of that treatment process. The partner can take some time, but oftentimes treatment treatment and and procedures to go through your your entire plan can take weeks, months, sometimes for five days a week, sometimes it goes for six to eight months or longer. So transportation is the number two need that people call us for. Well, when they call us for that information, we're able to help mobilize them through our road to recovery program. It was halted a little, as you mentioned earlier, Tom, through the COVID experience and the pandemic and how it hit the world. It really did put a pause on all those things. I'm very thrilled to say that this Northwest Pennsylvania market, the Erie areas in general, has been able to reestablish our road to recovery program um, and get people to help people get rides to their treatments and home from their treatments. That barrier of having transportation and access to care is just huge. Um, and oftentimes people want to understand what that means and how that looks because you need someone to be there with you to take you to and from those treatments. And people say, well, what, so what if I miss a treatment? What if I miss two treatments? Your doctors and the plans that these health systems have put together are very much based on science. They know that you need 42 treatments or you need 87 treatments. Mm -hmm. Missing them it impacts your quality of life or possibly your continuance of life as you move forward. And it's it's just huge as we sit there and realize that we were able to have this program relaunched and the board of advisors here in Northwest Pennsylvania was able to make a difference and actually help us recruit some folks to be part of that. And then I will stop and defer to, to Debbie to share a little bit about what the local board has been able to do around that. And then we can talk some more even about how we've worked with the health systems. Debbie, that would be great. Would you continue? Yes, our, our local board does a number of things. First of all, we help to recruit volunteers to get involved with both service delivery, such as the road to recovery. We create networks and get the word out about the need for people to actually help provide transportation through that volunteer network. We help mobilize people to raise money that ends up supporting the road to recovery here um, or to sponsor different events that we're doing um, in order to make more resources available to actually provide transportation and lodging for people locally if they have to travel, like some of the people from the rural areas of, say, Warren County or from Potter, I'm sorry, Forest County, um, need to come to Erie for treatment. We, we help to provide that support for transportation. We also um, provide support to get people involved and to get corporations involved in the fundraising that helps provide the resources that the local communities need and the, the Cancer Society needs to make these programs available to people in Northwestern Pennsylvania. That is phenomenal. And I think, and I hate to use this term, we live in a mall society. We believe everybody can just jump in a car and go down the, the road and and head to the dock. But that's not true. And what I am hearing from both of you, it's a critical need that there are a large number of folks that need some sort of transportation in order to get critical care. I guess there are other medical needs that people have that you help with, screenings, et cetera. How does that work? Yeah. As, as you look at it, one of the things that, that COVID and the pandemic was really impacting was people's ability to get screenings. What we have found... We're looking at over a 25 plus year history of a decrease in the fatality of, of cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And as we have had that progress for two, two and a half, almost three decades at this point of watching the fatality levels drop because we're detecting earlier, we know a lot of that had to do with screenings. Um, with the pandemic, it became a true challenge as most people had the perspective and most health systems were, were taxed to their limits already handling COVID that you know, people were afraid or didn't have the abilities or some facilities said they didn't even have the capacity at that point to handle the screenings. And we realized as we look at the difference and, and I'll share some just national numbers to put some scope onto it, but knowing that it hit Northwest Pennsylvania proportionately as well is that there were 2.13 million fewer women who got their breast cancer screenings in 2020 as compared to just two years prior. Hmm. And when you realize that when you look at cervical cancer, there were 4.47 million fewer women compared, again, to 2018 who got their screenings for cervical cancer. Huge. 
we don't know what the long-term impact of that will be. We know that we had been riding, like I said, a multi-decade trend of, of decrease in, in fatalities and, and realizing that that early detection makes all the difference. Finding something in stage one or stage two is such a different diagnosis and such a different approach than in finding someone who's stage three or stage four in many cases. We don't know what these two years or a year and a half plus of, of, of this willingness to be in the system. So the availability to have those done is going to have, but we expect it's going to take a long time for us to truly see the the impact and, and what it's done to folks and realizing how much every time you have that moment, what it means to to move forward. And uh, you know, I share a, a story. I had a one, young woman who I've known for several years. She got a melanoma diagnosis mm. in late February of 2020. She went urgently to have it out as all the threats of COVID were coming. She was able to go and have it surgically removed pretty much a week before the world shut down, essentially. Mm. And she literally has talked to me 50 or 60 times after that going, if I would have waited a month to get to have that checked, if I would have waited a month to have that difference, I can't imagine knowing that I had cancer on my body or in my body and, and dealing with it for the next 18 months or 20 months while no one was able to go or afraid to go towards a health system to have those screenings done. She goes, I cannot even imagine how much worse the pandemic could have been for her. And I, and I know that she was not alone in that situation and how many others were missing that opportunity. So uh, you had a double challenge, in other words, both folks yes. being afraid to go to the hospital and those in desperate need or critical need to some degree to get there and, and they maybe pre-need to eliminate the potential of cancer in their bodies. Oh boy, that's, a, that's an interesting story. You do um, function on the advice of your board of advisors. Debbie, do you want to talk about that, if you would? Well, the primary thing that our board of advisors is really doing is gathering and listening to the voice of the need of Northwestern Pennsylvania and really looking at and shaping the focus of engaging volunteers around meeting those needs, as well as raising additional dollars to make sure that those programs and services can be made available to people in the community. So we're mobilizing our networks to connect to people and to recruit volunteers to look at, you know, how do we get people involved in fundraising efforts and organizing groups to be involved in fundraising. So we're the kind of the boots on the ground, if you will, in helping to mobilize folks to get involved, both at the corporate level and at the individual level in the communities. How big is that group, or does it depend on the project at hand? Well, all, our board is a small and mighty number. We Right now, we have nine. We're hoping to maybe have 15 across the footprint of our multi-county area. Mm -hmm. and And our job is not so much to do the services, our job is to think strategically about what the needs are in Northwestern Pennsylvania, look at what the providers are experiencing in terms of their patient population. Do they need more transportation? Do they need more resources to be able to provide it? And our job is to help get the word out, help recruit volunteers to be involved in that and to assist in raising the money so that it can happen. Excellent. And, and a critical need, as we all know. Um, Eric McGaggy, Director of Community Development, um, how do you interface with other parts of the country? This is obviously a worldwide issue, but uh, Pennsylvania, you seem to be addressing uh, the issues um, very well. What, how do you relate with the rest of the country, so to speak? It's, it's amazing. It just the peers we have. And, and so what we have done as an organization is we've we've set up board groups all, all over the country. So in major metros, but as well as, as as most of the major communities where we're looking for our volunteers to tell us what and, and, and Debbie said it so well and so eloquently, you know, the ability to know what the community needs to, to be an ear to the ground to hear what the community needs and wants and then finding ways to help people connect and doing that. So finding ways to partner. And very honestly, whether that be other foundations and community organizations or nonprofits in the in the communities across the country, as well as corporate partners, as well as, you know, people are very familiar with the events we've held and some of the things that we've done. But I think the neatest part as we move forward is, and you said it so well when we started too, as well, Thomas, cancer's touched everyone. And so what we're finding is 
here's a chance to get ahead of it. Here's a chance to share information. Let us talk to your employee base. Let us talk to the entire group, you know, whether it be a, a, a service group in the area. I mean, we've partnered well with Rotary through the years. We've worked with a number of Chamber of Commerces through the years, mm -hmm. all across the country. And I will absolutely say it's impressive to see how many times we, and, and people have stepped up to say like, yeah, this has touched me. I don't want others to have to face this. I don't want this for my children. I don't want this for my grandchildren. I want to leave this world a better world than I found it. And the progress that's been made is great. But as we look across the country and see that the connections we're making everywhere have been huge. And as an organization, we have nationalized a lot of our efforts. So when we used to talk to companies here in Northwest Pennsylvania or beyond, we put it into a Salesforce process. And then what's mm. happening is if there's a satellite, a satellite branch of that same company in Iowa, that person in Iowa now knows that we've connected with this company and we're doing these pieces. So we truly are approaching it from a systemic nationwide and sometimes even global perspective. As you look at what we handle on a global perspective, helping different countries as they establish their cancer societies for some of them. It's oftentimes they're like, we need access to this screen here. This is a, this is a, a dire need for us in, in our country. Being able to share the perspectives of what we've learned here in our long rich history in, Amer in American Cancer Society across this country and seeing what we've done. And what we've really tried to do is be consistent as we go across the country. When CEPA are looking, if you need help in Erie, you know to call that number. You will have access. You'll have resources. It will share options with you. It will talk about treatment options. It will talk about what you can do for your family, your services, and, and opportunities that your family might need, that you might need. But then you might call that same 1-800 number and say, I have an uncle who lives in Idaho. Mm -hmm. What's available there? And having that same ability to connect them to resources in their local communities and say, this is what we need to do. And having that ability of being able to consistently offer support and resources and progress and sharing what's going through, we are constantly cited as a source in most documentations, in most publications that have to deal with cancer because we do a lot of work in, internally and we also fund a lot of researchers, obviously. And I, I mentioned the beginning of our, our conversation, a lot of people have known the American Cancer Society for research. We spent billions of dollars in our program over the years to make that happen. And we've seen progress. We've seen, you know, survival rates increase. We've seen, you know, as we've gone forward, early diagnosis happening more. We've seen the treatments and the services being offered making a difference in countless lives and we still have more to do and every day we keep doing it because we know there's somebody today who's going to for the first time ever hear those words you have cancer mm -hmm. we don't want them to feel like they're facing that alone that's so encouraging now i know you interface on the research side i'm sure with major research hospitals universities that do that kind of research work what about subjectively on on the community level what type of communication or networking do you offer a patient? Or how do you interface with the hospitals and a patient? Is there a program in place or is it just part of your daily course of work? It is a part of our daily course of work, but we connect to all the health systems. We, as people have a need in the community, when they say we need help, um, one of the things that we had talked about again was our access to care and, and transportation. Just this year, we were able to, to pull some grants together and award some grants to some to, to some local Northwest Pennsylvania health system locations to help with transportation as we were trying to get our road recovery program started up to help them have money internally so they could fund their folks to share the word of what was available to help people get to their treatments and then also share the word that road recovery was back and that this was another resource for them. So partnering with health systems, partnering with companies, and then again, spreading that word and I, I truly, have, and it's a dream I've had, I've always had is that people will know that what we do before they need us. So when they hear those words, so-and-so has cancer, you can say like, oh my gosh, call this phone number. They can help you. They help us right here in this community. Whether that be Mercer, Forest, Benango, Warren, Crawford, or Erie County, so that you have opportunities, you have resources, and that you can get all sorts of opportunities and information to get there and reach those communities in a way that's meaningful. And again, why we partner and hold some events, but partner with different groups to make that happen. Debbie Thompson, you and I and everyone have seen many, many messages on television and radio asking to support the American Cancer Society. Uh, well, how does that mechanism work now in the 21st century? Is fundraising different or is it, is it uh, mouth to ear? How, how is it working now in the 21st century, would you say? 
Okay, I'm sorry, Tom. Ask that question again. Oh, in the 21st century here, has fundraising for the American Cancer Society or your board locally, has, has your efforts changed? Is, how do they raise money now in the 21st century here? Well, believe it or not, raising money in the 21st century is very much like raising money has always been. Okay. It's people asking people to get involved okay. with a cause. Now, in in the 21st century, though we are using many more technological tools in order to do it. So, for example, where we might have a, you know, individual people might organize a Relay for Life team. And mm. those team members are asking people that they know to, to give a donation for, for how long they walk to support the Cancer Society. We can today put a, put a, request on Facebook and ask our friends through social media to be able to give a donation. Um, we, our companies now can go onto a website that's made, that's made especially for them and purchase daffodils so that they can have them brought to their place of work. You can actually sponsor, this is one of the, this is a very cool thing. And I actually did this. I actually bought a, a big case of daffodils uh-huh. and sent it to a one of my clients that's a nursing home so that their residents could have the beauty of the daffodils yep. um, to brighten their day. What a, um, what so a great it, idea. That is, it is a great idea. Yeah. I, I wish more people would do that because yeah. it, and that's all done online. I filled out a form online. I, I made that, you know, I made that gift and it was just a wonderful thing. So we have technology now enabling that, you know, ask, asking people to get involved process, but it's still very much people asking people. And we're trying to now get, and actually what we're, tra- we're trying now to be more strategic in how we engage companies and people to get involved with the both volunteer recruitment as well as the financial support Mm -hmm. uh, for the Cancer Society so that we're able to mobilize resources uh, more efficiently and effectively. And again, technology and media helps us do that. That's wonderful. Eric, do you have any uh, concluding remarks that you'd like to make? Uh, I think Debbie said it so very well. It's reaching to people in a very strategic way to help them know that we're here and that we have opportunities to help. And she said it so well. For a very long time, I think we used to ask and hope that people would come to see us at a place and a time to get their help or to sign up and fundraise. And in the world we're living in now, we realize that most people are involved with their lives and they have busy lives. So we can meet you where you are and, and make that difference and take some of the things that you love to do and turn that into a fundraising opportunity. In the past, we've had some folks who love to play pickleball. So they'd hold a pickleball uh, tournament yeah. with, pro- with proceeds coming to the American Cancer Society or people who just love. I mean, we, we've been blessed with a lot of wineries and distilleries across the state of Pennsylvania recently. And um, people who have done wine tours or hold, held events and they say, we're doing a tasting and pairing with local restaurants. And if you want to come that, and part of that involves a donation to the American Cancer Society with people doing things that they enjoy to do and do in their everyday lives and realizing that they can still have that opportunity and help those in need. And I'm sure you're not afraid uh, to accept a, uh, a major gift of some sort. Uh, is, we, that a, is that a separate program? That. Is that a separate program? Uh, it is. We have different folks in our organization who work with some of the major gift pieces. Mm-hmm. But no, we, we do not walk away from major gifts. Um, but at the same point, we have an, we're an organization that's been built on accepting donations for anyone who wants to make a difference and helping them understand how to do that. And I think the neatest part about what we do is cancer does not discriminate based on where you are, on socioeconomics, on race, religion, mm-hmm. or culture. We've done our very best to make our outreach across the country, especially in Northwest Pennsylvania, to include every group. So if you you say, hey, I want to be an elite athlete, I want to do marathons, we have opportunities to run marathons in Pittsburgh, if you like. If you are saying, like, I just want a beautiful flower to sit on my desktop, like like Debbie shared, that's a huge opportunity, and that's great. And then we have other people who want to do a family-friendly this or you know, have a campaign to raise awareness or, or funds for some other aspect of what we do with cancer. We, we try to have something for everyone because everyone is touched, and the days are gone when you can't say, you know, 
cancer as a word that people would say out loud like it was when we started as an organization all those many years ago. Eric, I want to thank you. Your your outlook, your presentation, and your point of view is excellent, and your uh, message is, is hopefully well heard on the program today. And a special thanks to Deborah Debbie Thompson, president of Strategy Solutions, for helping to make the program possible. We're certainly grateful to have learned many new things today. I would like to thank you both. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to work with town leaders like Debbie as well. Yes. And, and thank you, Tom, for getting the word out about this important cause.